If you are sick of hearing, make the logo bigger. If you are sick of endless design revisions, if you are sick of clients who do not respect your design process, please watch this video. We're gonna help you out. What is up? I am Harbert with Extra Credit Design Club and in this video, I am going to dive deep into how to work with clients in a way that gives you more creative freedom, but also gives them better results and leaves both of you feeling like you hit the jackpot. This video is going to be broken up into three sections. The first one, I am going to talk about the nature of the creative individual the nature of the client and what happens when these two natures come together in the wild. Why is it so easy to lose control of the situation? And let me tell you now, it is not what you think it is. In part two of this video, I am going to give you practical steps. Now that we know what's going on, I'm going to show you how to take control of the situation so you can have more creative freedom. The client is not gonna give you pushback. You're gonna get better design results and have a positive working relationship. And then finally, at the end of this video, you're gonna to wanna to stick around when I address doubts and concerns that might be brought up on your end, on the client's end, and how to resolve them. Part one, understanding the nature of the creative individual and the business minded. This is the most important thing you can do to improve your working relationship with clients. Who am I, Harbor, to be talking about the nature of these people? True, admittedly, I am no psychologist. However, I am a graphic designer through and through. And I am also an entrepreneur through and through. I've been doing graphic design for 15 years. I have a master's degree in design from the School of Visual Arts in New York. I am capital C creative individual. However, I am an entrepreneur. I've been running, starting, owning my own businesses for the past 10 years. My father was an entrepreneur and his father and the like. And in fact, the School of Visual Arts, where I got my master's degree, the program was called Designers as Entrepreneurs. So yes, while I am this creative individual at heart, I have for the past decade been navigating the business world. So I see both sides of the coin. Most of my friends are either designers or entrepreneurs, and I hear what each one has to complain about about the other. So as kind of a funny, fun way to help you understand the nature of these two people, I'm going to act out a scenario from two different points of view. First, from the perspective of the graphic designer just after a project has gone awry with a difficult client. And then from the perspective of the client, just after a collaboration has gone awry with a difficult designer. Remember, it's the same scenario, but with two points of view. First, this should sound familiar. This is a graphic designer venting to his friend's scene. It's ridiculous. I don't need someone telling me how to do my job. I don't tell him how to run his business. Why does he think that he can tell me how to do graphic design? For six years, I've been studying composition, color, typography, the principles of design, but no, he's the expert. The sheer audacity, the arrogance is unparalleled. We have all been here right? And in this scenario, yes, it is very clear that the client has overstepped his bounds and is in the wrong. We, the designer, didn't tell them how to do their job, so why do they think they can tell us how to do our job? It is very frustrating, very difficult. Now, the same scene from the perspective of the client, this one might be new, scene. It's ridiculous. I don't need someone telling me how to run my business. 
I've been running it successfully for the past six years. I know how to organize people. I know how to make decisions. That's the reason my business is successful. And because that business is successful, I am able to feed my family. And my 10 employees all can feed their family. But no, the art is more important than that. It's insane. When I tell the hairdresser how I want my hair cut, they cut it. I tell the cook what I want to eat, they cook it. When I tell the designer to make the logo bigger, suddenly the world ends. I know what's best for my business. But no, they're the expert. They come in here and after a week, they know better than me. The sheer audacity, the arrogance is unparalleled. And scene. Now, in this scenario, it is very clear that the graphic designer is at fault. Surely I, the business owner, know what's best for my business. The graphic designer doesn't understand the bigger picture and is willing to put art above the livelihood of me and all of my employees. Now, hopefully, you can be a little empathetic and you can see that from each person's point of view, they are totally in the right and the other person is totally in the wrong. So the big question is how can this conflict be resolved and avoided in the future? It all comes down to understanding the natures of each person. The nature of the creative individual is to freely explore the enchanted forest that is the creative domain without any thought of the outside world. They don't impose rules upon themselves, much less anyone else. In a word, they need freedom. Now, the nature of the business-minded is to strategize, is to organize, is to create something where before there was nothing. Order from chaos. In a word, the business-minded needs order. So there we have it. We have freedom and we have order. Now, how can we have these two seemingly opposing natures, freedom and order, coexist in harmony rather than contention? Now, I know it can be fun to vent to your friends about steamrolling clients, but when you lose control in a client-designer collaboration, the truth is that most of the time, it is the designer's fault. It is your fault. Now, I know it kind of sucks to hear, but if you can get over that, then it actually is pretty good news. Because if the reason you're losing control is because of something you're doing, you can do something to change that dynamic. You can do something to gain back and maintain this creative control in the relationship. If it was really all the client's fault, well, you can't control other people. There would be nothing that you can do. It would be hopeless and you would be doomed to forever having bad relationships with clients. So now you're probably asking, why is it your fault? You see, it is because as designers, remember our nature, freedom, we are not defining specifically the rules of collaboration. We do not have a set system for how we work. And if you remember the nature of the client, the organized, the systematic thinker, the person who creates something where before was nothing. They see our void in process and nature hates voids. They will automatically be filled. And especially the nature of the business minded, they're going to see, hey, this graphic designer doesn't really have a process. I'm good at organizing. I am going to dictate how this relationship is going to work. The truth is, if you do not come to the table with a system, a set way about how you are going to work with this individual, you are creating a vacuum. Nature hates vacuums and it will be filled. So you should ask yourself as a creative individual, 
with your nature being all about freedom. Would you rather have the rules of engagement impose upon you or would you rather freely yourself create those rules to live by? I'm sorry to tell you, no rules, total freedom in a collaboration between a designer and a business person is not an option. Your two choices are you make the rules or they make the rules. Now that brings us to part two. How do we set these rules of collaboration? How do we invite the clients into the car without letting them drive? And within part two, we are going to have two little sections. First, I am going to talk about the importance of defining your relationship with a client. What is the appropriate relationship and how can you communicate that with the client? In the second half, after we define our relationship with the client, I am going to hit you with three ground rules, three things that you need to establish in order to carve out a space for yourself to freely create while also giving the client the order that they need to freely operate. So you can both feel like you have more freedom and the result of your design collaboration will be so much better. Okay, defining the relationship. Your client is your client, not your customer. You do not take orders from them. You have conversations with them. Your relationship is more like a lawyer client than a customer and a cook. The client lawyer relationship starts with a conversation. The lawyer asks the client questions and the question tells the lawyer everything they need to know in order to do their job. Then if the client is a good client, they will let the lawyer do their job. And if the lawyer is a good lawyer, they will carefully listen to everything the client said, hang on their every word and be able to determine what the important information they need is in order to win their case. And it's the same with designer client. Great clients who know how to work with designers will already understand this relationship and you won't need to explain it to them. And if you want to know how to attract these great clients, I did make a video on that. You can watch it right here. If you have not yet watched it, I highly advise you to do so because yes, you might be able to convince an inexperienced client to treat you more like a lawyer and less like a cook. But if you don't have to educate your client on this dynamic before you start, your life is going to be so much easier. Now that you and the client understand the relationship dynamic, it is time for you to lay down some ground rules. There are three rules that you need to lay down in order to create this win-win collaboration where you have creative freedom, they have the order they need, and everyone is happy. Number one, define and agree upon the strategy before you ever start designing. Now, what do I mean by strategy? Strategy is basically this, what you are going to say and who you are going to say it to. In my experience, it is rare that a client comes to me, the designer, with a clearly defined strategy. Bringing it back to the lawyer metaphor, it's rare that a client would ever come to a lawyer with a perfectly formed defense. They just know that they need a lawyer. So it is up to us as designers to start this conversation. Ask the client about their business. Ask them about their target audience. Ask them about their competition and what makes them different. Why the heck would anybody buy from their company when there are a thousand other companies out there? 
Once they can answer this question, they got a strategy. As an example, a poorly defined strategy is this. We are a secondhand resell marketplace for women age 18 to 50. Our core values are about sustainability, trust, and collaboration, right? It seems like a good strategy. They know what they want to say, and they know who they're talking to. But here's the kicker. Targeting women who are 18 to 50 and having the core values of collaboration, trust, and sustainability could literally describe any secondhand reseller marketplace out there. It doesn't answer the question, why the heck would anybody buy from you when there are a thousand companies like you? Now, an example of a good, well-defined strategy for that same company might be this. We are a second-hand reseller marketplace who target professional women age 25 to 40 who have more money than they have free time. Our core values are exclusivity, efficiency, and self-sustainability. That strategy is unique. There's really only one company like that. They know specifically who they are talking to and they are saying something unique that no other company within their space is saying. Number two, continually reference the strategy. Once the strategy is established and agreed upon as the best course of action, you need to continually reference that strategy. Every design decision that you make should be serving that strategy. And when you present your design work, before you present it, remind the client of the strategy. This is what we're gonna say. This is who we're talking to. It is also important to coach the client on how to give effective feedback. If you don't tell the client how to give feedback, remember you're creating a void and the client is naturally going to fill it with some order and they're gonna fill it with how they run their company, telling people what to do and expecting that those people will do it. So when you have the client give you feedback, coach them. Let's say that you're creating a company, uh, natural toy company for first time parents and the strategy is you're telling these first time parents that natural toys will help their child connect with the natural world around them. So the client isn't really welcome to say, I don't like that color, but the client is welcome to say, I'm not sure that that color is portraying the natural energy that we want. Is there a way that we can make that color feel more natural? Where most designer client relationships go awry is in how the client gives feedback. So this step is amply important. But remember, you cannot continually reference the strategy if you do not have a well-defined strategy from step number one. Ground rule number three, present as few options as possible. Imagine this scenario. You go to the doctor, you tell them what's wrong with you, they diagnose your problem. What do you want to have happen? You want the most effective solution to your problem. Imagine you go to the doctor and they hit you with three different options. You know, you're in trouble. You need a help. I can hit you with A, B, or C. Which is best? You're not a doctor. You don't know. You are not doing any favors to your clients by giving them three design options and asking them to choose the best one. You are the expert. They are not. When you invite them to do something that's way outside of their expertise and you dang know it, you are just asking to be frustrated because you know every time they choose your least favorite option. Now, of course, 
the perfect ideal scenario is to just present one design solutions. But of course, you can expect revisions. But it will be similar to a doctor needing to adjust the, you know, is it 50 milligrams or 75 milligrams of this specific medication? And it won't be a choice or a revision like, is it medicine or is it surgery or is it dieting? You won't have to deal with that crazy world. It will just be refining little tweaks. Again, you are not doing the client any favors when you invite them to do your job for you. Part number three, addressing concerns. Right here, I want to go back to when I said that it is your fault that you lose control of these creative collaborations. And I asked you to do something that goes against your nature and create a system that you can present to the client. And you might be concerned and you might be sour and you might think, well, why do I have to act against my nature as a designer? Why can't the client act against their nature and give free reign? But understand this, the client is acting against their nature when they relinquish this control to a designer. You need to understand that most of the time you are working with leaders who are used to ordering around people. It's what they're good at. It is in their nature. So when you say, hey, our relationship is more like a lawyer, you tell me what needs to be done and trust me to do it, you are inviting them to act against their nature as well. It's a give, give relationship. I have yet to find the client who says, let's have no systems for feedback. We'll just wing in a prayer and see how it works. That person, as far as I've ever been able to encounter, does not exist. So us as creatives, we are naturally empathetic. We can more easily reach across the aisle and bridge the gap of these two natures. If we are first willing to give, then generally the client will see that and understand, hey, I will also be willing to give. Concern number two is that this might seem like a lot of work. You have to first define your relationship with the client and then you have to set these ground rules. You have to define a strategy that's new. You have to continually reference the strategy in your design. That might be a new process. And you have to just only pitch one idea. That might be new too. These might be too many skills, too much business stuff that you don't want to have to worry about creating systems and and it's just too much. It's outside of your wheelhouse and it's something you don't want to learn. I understand that. I get that entirely. For a lot of years, I did not take on client work because I didn't want to have to deal with it. If this happens to be you, I did create a video of how you as a designer can make money without having a job, without having to deal with clients. It's all about passive income. If you are interested in learning about that, you can click the link to the video right here. But again, I digress on to the next concern. As you apply this information into your design process, you might start working with a client and you might stumble over your words when you're trying to define the relationship. You might set the ground rules of strategy, but you're not very good at helping the client arrive at a good strategy, or you don't know how to tell them that yeah, your strategy that you came to me with is all right, but let's make it better or see if we can make it better. It's a skill set that you need to learn. So if you start applying these things and you get the same result, you're frustrated with clients, don't worry, it's just like anything else. If you continue, it will get easier and easier and eventually it will become second nature. It is a skill set that will make you a more empathetic designer. 
better to relate with your clients, your clients will be able to better relate to you and you will have more harmonious relationships. But again, this is a skill that takes practice. It's not a magic wand that you wave once and all your problems are solved. Next concern, from time to time, you may actually run into the perfectly arrogant client who pretends to listen to the relationship dynamic, agrees upon it, but has no intention of actually treating you with any respect whatsoever. They treat you as an order taker and they are the customer who is always right. The more you develop the skills of properly working with clients, the easier and sooner you will be able to recognize the bad clients who are unwilling to give when they see you give. My advice in this situation is to take one of two paths. Path one, charge enough for the job that you can then take an appropriately long vacation that will be well deserved after working with this heinous individual. Or option two, just walk away. You may be saying to yourself, I can't do that. I need the money and trust me, I do relate to that in a very deep way. There have been times where I've taken jobs with clients that I knew would be terrible, but I had to do it because I just needed the money. Again, I would invite you to watch this video here about how to attract better clients. And hopefully you can cut down the number of bad clients and increase the number of good clients. Most of the information that I've talked about here is my interpretation of what I'm learning from this book right here, The Win Without Pitching Manifesto. It's a quick read, it's a small book. And if you wanna buy it, I will have a link in the description of this video. But that's it, and that's all. I'm Harbor with Extra Credit Design Club. If you like what you see, you can subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next.